the newer systems that you would use additively homomorphic encryption have a more involved and uh, susceptible setup phase that you have to do really carefully. In this setup phase, um, the parties running it are going to use um, asymmetric encryption, so some forms of public key uh, cryptography, to take um, some secret and cook up from it various queries that you would want to ask later on and somehow encrypt them in advance in a way that the prover, the honest prover can answer them very easily and efficiently, but um, a prover who wants to prove a false statement will not. So this setup phase involves some secret that if it is somehow leaked or revealed, um, you know, can ruin the system in the sense that knowing that secret, that trapdoor would allow to, you know, forge pseudo-proofs of, of any statement, true or false. We published a paper showing how you can do multi-party, secure multi-party computation to amortize this, uh, this uh, harmful secret, this trapdoor among several parties. If even one of us is, is honest in the sense that don't reveal the secret, then even if the rest collude, the whole system is still secure. Zero knowledge snark systems, they depend on this kind of piece of mathematical scaffolding known as a reference string. And it's a way of really making the computations that you need to do for a zero knowledge proof sufficiently speedy that you can get this stuff to public networks straight away. So it allows the kind of the proof size to be quite small and the amount of work that needs to be done for you to send a transaction to be kept relatively low. What it does mean, though, is it's, it's predicated on computing a kind of encrypted number but no one must know what that encrypted number is. And so the way we did this was through a sort of form of multi-party computation where we went to our community of people who were interested in the Aztec protocol and said, will you take part in this ceremony? And this ceremony is such that it would require every single one of these participants to collude with everyone else in order to be able to reconstruct this number that actually needs to be destroyed and never known. So if just one person behaves honestly, and they destroy their, their toxic information, the system's secure. There's a variety of technologies that, that allow you to scale systems up and assert their correctness and computational integrity, and also to do so in a privacy-preserving manner. With ZK rollups, uh, we do something very elegant. We provide a zero-knowledge proof, uh, or like 16 zero-knowledge proof, or SNARK, of validity of all the transactions that happened that produce this new root hash. And the snark is verified by the smart contract itself. So what it means is it's been verified on all the full nodes of Ethereum. And only if the snark is valid, uh, then we change the, the new root hash on the smart contract. And this way we can guarantee that no invalid transaction is ever included. In That's the difference between optimistic and ZK. In ZK, you just uh, send a proof and this proof is validated by the smart contract. And if this proof is invalid, then uh, the smart contract, you know, just the transaction fails, the transaction throws. So it's like the, the state doesn't change. Okay. So it's impossible to forge an invalid transaction in the ZK rollup. And even better, when it's forged, so once the transaction is forged, it cannot be rolled back. You know, it's, it's final, it's, it's, it's there. Um, so you normally have someone called sequencer collecting the transactions from the users and packing them in a block and computing the new root hash of this block. With all the rollups right now, uh, as far as I'm aware, everyone is currently using centralized sequencers uh, because with rollups, you do not rely for the sequencer on the sequencer for security. With ZK rollups and ZK sync specifically, what you do is you submit a transaction to the sequencer, asking them to withdraw the funds for you uh, on their one. And they will include in the block, and the moment the block is completed and, and verified on Ethereum, you will automatically get the funds on Ethereum to the address which you wished. They cannot censor you NL1. So if, if you feel censored, you can always go to layer one and retrieve your funds through some uh, additional mechanisms. In our case, it's called priority queue. And, uh, and we have something called exodus mode or emergency exit mode, where you can exit without asking anyone for permission. And so a system that is scalable, that's the S in a Stark, which means that 
as the number of transactions you're processing goes to infinity, proving time scales with it nearly linearly. So it's almost the same cost to just compute the stuff as it is to generate a proof for it. And at the same time, verifying a proof uh, scales exponentially smaller than the amount of computation. And also transparent, which means that there is no trusted setup and, and all the the only ingredient that you need in order to make the system uh, uh, secure is, is public source of randomness or you need to assume that the universe has some entropy in it. One could say that the term succinct refers only to one part of scalability, which is you want the verifier to be very efficient. So succinctness is not enough for scalability. It's necessary, but not sufficient. You also need this other aspect, which is uh, super efficient proving time. So when we coined the definition of a Stark, we wanted to make sure that we're also capturing that aspect as well, which is why uh, we, we think it's better to use scalability as this sort of uh, two-pronged definition, both efficient proving time and efficient verification time. Snarks have uh, famously very short uh, proofs, like around 200 bytes. Bulletproofs have longer proofs, around, let's say, 2 kilobytes or so. And uh, Starks have longer proofs, uh, around 20 kilobytes. So you go one order of magnitude increase, moving from Starks to Bulletproofs and then to Starks. In terms of uh, verification time, Snarks and Starks are pretty similar. They're very, very fast. Uh, Starks are a little bit faster in verification, but, you know, 10 milliseconds in Snarks versus, I don't know, 8 milliseconds or less in Starks. And then Bulletproofs are, are less so because uh, verification time in Bulletproofs scales actually linearly with the amount of computation. Not uh, so, so Bulletproofs are not scalable according to our definition of the term. Uh, that's in terms of verification time. Proving time is fastest in Starks, then about one order of magnitude slower in uh, Snarks and Bulletproofs. And uh, I think the most important difference is in uh, sort of this other dimension of future-proofing the systems or what kind of assumptions you're using. So Starks require only uh, the existence of some collision-resistant hash function which implies that they're plausibly post-quantum secure and uh, they require very lean cryptography. Bulletproofs require assumptions regarding the discrete log uh, over elliptic curve groups, which is a slightly more exotic uh, problem, but it's been around for, I don't know, like two decades or so. And then SNARKs require things called knowledge of exponent, which are even more recent and slightly more exotic. The first generation of ZK rollups were application specific. They could only do some very limited fixed functionality, for example, transfers or, or AMM or a DEX, but it, it was limited to, to one function which could be repeated multiple times. With smart contracts, the challenge was that the users want to define smart contracts themselves. A CK Sync 2 will have not just smart contracts, but full EVM compatibility or like EVM portability. You will be able to take existing smart contracts that are live on layer one and easily port them to ZK Sync and just deploy out of box. Most of them will just work. And this was very hard to wrap in zero knowledge proofs. Like the zero knowledge proofs require the programs for which we can construct snarks and like prove some computational statements to be representable as arithmetic circuits. You can think of it as a, as a, uh, as a, like as a physical circuit. You have some inputs and then it goes, goes through some gates in like one, one way flow without, uh, w without back loops. And then at the end, you get some results. So the other way to think about it is a, is a, just a function, a mathematical function. F from X is equal to, a plus B times C, blah, 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 you know, like some, some very complex expression. But it's a single expression. There is no way to encode loops in this expression. There is no way to encode conditionals, except for just like build two branches of, of this conditional statement separately and then combine them uh, conditionally. Like 
if we wanted to go to the left branch, then take this result. If we wanted to go to the, to the right branch, take this result. But th th that, that's some fixed structure which you cannot program. So how you add programmability? Um, so th that, that was a big challenge. One of the main problems with zero-knowledge cryptography is constructing these proofs is generally quite slow. As I said, it's like a like factor of 100k to a million times slower than running a computation. Now, one of the ways that this is, can be solved is by delegating proof construction to third parties. But because we'd ha we're dealing with private transactions, you can't delegate proof construction to a third party because then you're leaking information and secrets to that third party. So, in, so effectively, all of these programs that are being created in Noir they're all being turned into zero knowledge proof set where the pre-construction is happening, be made directly by the user, you know, by people with old laptops, crummy phones. Noir is our highly efficient ZK snap programming language. It's a, it's a Rust based syntax language that compiles directly to highly optimized uh, long circuits. The first thing that Noir needs to solve is that um, these programs that people are creating need to be turned into extremely efficient zero knowledge proofs. You have a program, a uh, solidity program. The, when you compile it, you get a set of uh, byte. Uh, you set a set of bytes that are opcodes mainly. So you just take those bytes, and instead of running here, you just run there. It's like uh, at the end, is um, from the user perspective, is like having a side chain. So it should work the same way with a zk VM. So we have a Grow sixteen or Blonk that's uh, validating a set of Starks. Mm -hmm. Okay, in each Stark, we expect to be able to process half a million gas, and we can have, I would say, easily about 1,000 Starks in a single proof. So this is maybe two orders of magnitude of the current Ethereum. So you can actually get privacy out of box with, with this kind of type of solution with ZK rollups, because for the transactions uh, that contain some Snarks for privacy, you don't have to publish the proofs on chain. It's sufficient to have them as a witness or as input of the transaction, which you just omit in the final block, but you verify them in, as a part of, of, of your block proof. Uh, so that means that you will be able to implement something like Zcash protocol on top of ZK Sync, and the transactions, uh, the shielded transactions in this protocol will cost almost the same as normal transfers, just slightly more expensive. So in a nutshell, it enables private tokens on Ethereum. It's a kind of a privacy layer that you can use to either create a private token that acts a, a, like somewhat like an ELC20 token, or you can wrap an existing ELC20 token and uh, make transfers of it private. The reason why we went with the UTXO model is because it's significantly easier to give strong privacy guarantees um, in a UTXO model than it is in an account-based model. Longer term, if you want to break the transaction graph entirely, so you want to hide not just the values being sent, but the identities, then that makes an account-based model extremely difficult to do because if you're hiding people's identities, then you don't really want there to be a kind of a, like one encrypted number which represents somebody's balance because making repeated modifications to this balance, it's, it's very difficult to do that without leaking the fact that those transactions are connected. But the problem with these approaches is that um, in a private world, um, you can't have public state because modifying a public, vari public state variable leaks information about what you're doing. For example, things like Uniswap. You, for Uniswap, you need to understand the total amount, the total supply you have of a given asset to perform, to understand how much liquidity you have. And so if you deposit into a liquidity pool, then you're changing the total amount of liquidity. That's public variable. So people can see what you've deposited. That's not private. Um, similarly for MakerDAO, if you create a uh, collateralized debt position that's private, that means it's encrypted. And so how in the blazes is anybody supposed to figure out if you're becoming under collateralized? And if they are, how are they supposed to liquidate your position? Because it's encrypted. Only, only the CDB creator knows how to decrypt it. And they're not going to help you liquidate their position. So that's one of the fundamental problems um, with, with, with privacy. Um, basically, you leave, you make, you keep the DeFi protocols public. You know, Uniswap, make a DAO, you leave them where they are, you know, hanging out on layer one, completely public, everyone can see what's going on. And what you do is you make the assets private. You ensure that individuals have, uh, that their holdings of various cryptocurrencies is anonymous. So if, for example, let's consider the, the make a DAO position again. Imagine, you know, you know, make it as public so you can see when a CDP is created, you can see its value, you can see when it comes under collateralized and liquidated, but you don't know who holds it. 
And that's very high quality privacy because at that, I mean, it could be anybody. And so the most important thing isn't to, in, in our opinion, to make the, 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 the DeFi protocols private. It's not to make the, 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 um, this effectively like the sites which interact with the value private. The important thing is to make the value holders private and give them anonymity. And, and that's how we're planning on doing and on, on achieving privacy.